Hi, everyone. This is Alan McKay. Welcome to episode 90. I'm speaking with Paddy Rangel, one of the leaders in hologram technology and VR and so much more. Let's dive in. Welcome to the Alan McKay Podcast. Alan is an Emmy Award-winning visual effects artist and mentor to many leading industry experts. Listen in as Alan talks with other industry leaders in film, video games, and visual effects about their experience, lessons, and methodology. Alan will teach you pivotal advice to fast-track your career, better your skills, and reach your ultimate dream job. Check out the latest episodes on alanmckay.com. All right, so here we go again. Uh, I'm really excited about this one. This is a really good friend of mine. Patty and I go way back. I've known her for, God, a long time now, <laughs> maybe 10 years, I'm not sure. Um, and we met at a conference, I think, in Guadalajara in Mexico. And patty has got such an amazing background. I actually want to leave it to be a bit of a surprise just because I kind of feel like with Patty, her credentials are so amazing that... Every single time you hear something, it's just like, holy crap, there's a whole new layer or level to um, to her story. And so, I kind of feel like in a way, our conversation kind of escalates and escalates. And uh, I feel really privileged to have the opportunity to do this episode and also privileged to have Patty as a friend. So, I'll just give a hint and say that Patty's uh, background is being one of the pioneers to do with holograms in her field and also is currently a resident artist at the arena stage in Washington, DC. Um, we go into a lot of stuff. She studied at NASA's Singularity University. She's collaborated on dozens of epic projects related to VR, MR, uh, holograms, you name it. Um, I loved doing this episode and I learned a lot and I tried to keep up as much as I could as well. Um, let's get into this episode. I'm really excited about this one. So here is Patty Rangel. Okay, just quickly, one of the biggest problems that we face as artists is figuring out how much we're worth. Typically, the situation is that we go on a job interviews and we're asked how much we're going to charge. We either shoot ourselves in the foot by saying that we charge less than we're worth so that way we get the gig and indirectly end up leaving tens of thousands of dollars accumulatively over time on the table rather than actually asking what we should be charging. At the same time, you don't want to alienate your employers by asking for too much and leaving yourself out in the cold. So what I've done is I put together a website, check it out, www.vfxrates.com. And this is a chance for you to be able to put in your experience, your discipline, the location you're working, all the good things that will give you a fairly accurate idea of what you and everyone else should be charging in your discipline. This is something that I'm going to continue to build and flesh out over time. But the key thing is actually that I don't want to just showcase how much you should be worth but also show you and hand you the tools to grow beyond that and to learn to negotiate better, to learn to ask for the, the right amount of money in the right way. There's lots of additional tools and information I want to hand over to you. Everything's free. Check it out, vfxrates.com. Put in your information and you'll instantly get notified of how much money you should be charging per hour as a VFX artist. vfxrates.com. Patty, so you and I go way, 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 way back, uh, and it's really cool to finally get to chat about this stuff. I love it because I get to find out a lot more about you. Usually when we're chatting, we're more talking about partying and having fun, and we're not really too focused on work and tech talk and things like that. But at the same time, like I've always been intrigued by all the stuff you're doing, and it's hard to keep up with all the different things you're doing. It's insane. Do you want to quickly uh, introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit about what it is that you do? I just, I feel like I'm mostly an innovator and a pioneer because when I've tried to answer that question before, it's always been, well, you know, what I do doesn't really exist in the industry that I'm currently in. But um, yeah, I started in immersive virtual reality about seven years ago, or maybe 10, I don't know, it's been a while. Um, but being able to track the technology through different sectors from if its first, you know, exposure to the world coming out of R&D labs and trickling down through Fortune 500s, aerospace defense, um, medicine, uh, eventually entertainment. About three years ago, I was meeting with studios, now with theater. 
Uh, so I'm somewhere between a consultant, an experienced designer, a virtual reality producer. Um, I'm a holographer. I do a lot of things, uh, mostly, you know, if we were to cut it down into layman's terms, anywhere between design, management, and production using high tech. But I think for, for, for me personally, it is a journey and seeing where things are going and how you could actually take steps moving forward and just like stand in the threshold of innovation and look around and see what, what can be created from that. It's, it's always like a process of integration and creation. So you have an epic amount of experience in so many different areas. And at the same time, you're an early adopter of many different technologies as they come to fruition. Do you consider yourself a bit of a futurist? Right. Well, you know, I, I, when I went to Singularity University at NASA in 2011, I was part of the future studies and forecasting track. Uh, Ray Kurzweil was heading that, and there was probably maybe about three or four students that were part of that that year. What I found fascinating is that most of, you know, in, in multiple industries, people term futurists. What I call, well, I just had early exposure to technology. And if you know what that technology is capable of doing, it's a little, it's a bit easier to guesstimate kind of what direction it's going to go, what it's going to require, how it's going to impact. But, um, you know, for other people, they're like, oh, well, you know, you're just, I think even Google has Astro Teller, right, <laughs> as part of their team. And um, it really is just kind of being a, a, at the beginning, at the inception of the technology and then, you know, realizing what the capabilities for integration and then for market distribution, um, that's really where you get the big impact once it hits critical mass. And then you're you're trying to kind of <laughs> figure out, is this disruptive? <laughs> but um, yeah, it's been an interesting journey. I love it. That's so freaking cool. And I'm just curious, in regards to NASA's Singularity University, which, again, I think is such an amazing opportunity, how did that come about? It was fascinating, and it was a complete surprise. Um, I actually had to leave my work at that time, and I was working with AV Concepts um, that had a Musion holographic stage. Um, I had been maybe about a couple months after I achieved the uh, integration of putting um, an avatar from the Second Life virtual world um, on a holographic stage it was actually three different avatars that were coming in life, life size, and they performed on stage with a live musician. That was the first time that integration was achieved um, using multiplayer gaming. And then shortly after, um, Snoop Dogg and a producer named Dylan, um, Dylan Brown approached me about having Snoop Dogg go on tour with the Far East Movement as a hologram because he couldn't physically go. And in conversations and in watching our demo, they were like, hey, you know what? We have a friend that might be interested in this. And so they brought in Dr. Dre. And um, Dr. Dre was talking about, well, bringing somebody back to life. So that was Tupac. And um, that was like, I, I had to leave AV Concepts right as the Tupac deal was starting. And um, I still kept in touch with the technical directors and whatnot because it was it was new to the industry too. They were trying to figure out how were they gonna get Tupac, you know, maybe rotorscoped and who were they gonna deal with and so many people. It's like a whole industry effort that, you know, brought Tupac back to life. But, you know, I had this golden opportunity to go to Singularity and I got almost like a ninety five percent of scholarship to go. So typically it's twenty five thousand dollars to go for three months. And um, and I just thought, well, you know, I, I don't want to be 80 years old wondering, well, what would that have been like? And um, I got to NASA and we actually had to live on base. So we had to go through security check. Um, there's a couple of military dorms or whatnot. So that's where we stayed. And we spent most of our time just going back and forth from the dorm to the school. Um, the school is one of the buildings. And. What was fascinating is that there were actual NASA astronauts that were on faculty and they were telling us their experience. And, you know, Dan Barry's been to space, I believe, two times. And he's just talking about, you know, what it's like to be out there and, you know, of robotics and um, all of the people that they brought in as faculty or as guest speakers were top of the line, the people that were just at the threshold of innovation. And so we spent literally like six days a week, about 15 to 16 hour days, just learning, listening to speakers, um, learning about the global grand challenges. 
Um, and then we felt that sense of purpose. The, you know, 89 people from around the world were brought here to address the global grand challenges, which are very real. They're things that, you know, they're impacting humanity and um, we need to address them as a collective. I appreciated the way that Singularity University opened up the the ability to solve a problem on a global scale to people as a crowdsourced type of um, innovation and as a crowdsourced approach, because mostly, at least in the past, you know, when you had when you have problems or issues that you're facing on that scale, most people rely on governments, you know, to to solve this. But this was like, hey, we're going to get some of the brightest minds, the people that applied. I mean, people applied from all around the world and we're going to bring in experts in their field. So it was multicultural. Um, it was multidisciplinary. And I think that when you approach any type of um, any type of innovation with a multidisciplinary approach, you're always going to get the best results because it really cuts down on the um, on the red tape and, and on the hierarchies of like, well, you know, we're engineering and you're marketing, so you can't be involved in this process. Everybody um, after like the first month and a half of just listening to experts and, you know, um, going to site visits to Google, to Autodesk, um, you know, different lo- with some people got tours of NASA. Um, then we were put into teams and then asked to address a different global grand challenge. And all of the team members had to listen to each other. And they all had to, you know, if, if there was an artist that had a, an idea about how to solve a problem, they were listened to, even though they were not an engineer or a programmer. So I think a lot of what I'm doing personally in regards to adding the arts to STEM has a lot to do with my experience at Singularity, because for the first time in my life, I was able to participate in a process that previously had been open only to programmers and engineers. And and what that made me realize is that you can approach research and development from an artistic perspective. You can create rapid prototyping from an artistic perspective. You can ideate, you know, having a creative director or somebody that has a marketing type of background um, involved from the beginning of the process. And it's very dynamic and it, and it pushes the engineers and the programmers to think differently, you know, and, um, and it was a it was a breath of fresh air. So uh, I was inspired. Um, yet it was very very challenging because, you know, when you're going at it six days a week for you know, you 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 start getting tired and you have to you have to deal with the dynamics of being in enclosed spaces that you are like living on a uh, on a base, and you're pretty much that is your life for three months, and then you come up with the pressure of, well, you know, these teams could potentially become startups. These teams could actually become your future. And um, and that's, you know, when the heat was on and that's when everybody just kind of stepped up their game. And, you know, there was companies like Matternet that build a quadcopter and they were coming up with ideas about how to create, you know, some type of an open source network where you could deliver medicines to, you know, remote regions in Africa. I mean, just the things that were discussed in that space, it's beyond beyond what what you experience out in the real world because nobody makes fun of you for saying, Hey, we should build a space elevator, you know? So from having the astrophysicists having conversations with people talking about, you know, quantum superpositioning and you got other people that, you know, are just addressing poverty with like green tech and blue tech. It was just a culmination of, of an experience that is unlike anything else in the world. I highly recommend it. Um, it's it's challenging, but it's something that will when you come out as a supplement to any educational program um, is is what is needed in the world. Um, I think that a lot of people who go to Singularity and challenge themselves to create a startup, um, that's you know when you might see some disappointments because you're you're faced with the typical startup you know. Uh, challenges that some might work, some might not. You might get funding, you might not. But if you look at it as like, hey, I'm going to go there to learn something, to meet people from around the world, to be exposed to ideas, and to learn like what where we are in technology as far as a human species, it's definitely something that will that will be very fulfilling. Yeah, I can't imagine uh, how inspiring it would have been to 
be a part of that and to also just be surrounded by other like-minded individuals who are all bringing their personal experiences together to uh, focus on bigger issues and really focus on things that are a lot more important than a lot of the day-to-day distractions that we have in front of us. Um, I guess for you having experienced that and getting to be around so many amazing and inspiring people, what was the biggest key takeaway that you got from that? The biggest aha moment or the most influencing person that you got to speak with or learn from? It was a convert. I would say the, the number one most important moment was a conversation I had with Ray Kurzweil regarding artificial intelligence. Um, because I was one of three students chosen to go to the Google artificial intelligence conference. And, um, One of the things that I asked Ray was about the future of AI. So many people are fearful about what it could do, what what's going to happen when the singularity happens. And this this mind, this artificial mind is more intelligent than the entire human species. And would it be threatened? Is it going to retaliate or is it going to take over? Are are we going to cease to are we becoming the endangered species? And what he said is, Patty, It all depends on the information that people are putting out on the Internet now, because that is going to be the brain of the AI. And so it really is up to us to be conscious that we are creating an intelligent uh, entity and that its brain is going to be influenced by our data and our metadata. And when you think about that, when you really stop to think about that, you're like, well, you know, I mean, there's a lot of porn out there. There's a lot of violence. So um, being conscious of, of how we put information, how we use media, how we use social media, all of that is very important because that is going to be the future, right? I mean, that's what we're going to be faced with is, is those philosophical conversations with ourselves. And it's going to be a mirror, holding a mirror up to nature and having that conversation with ourselves, which includes the things that we don't like and the things that we aspire to. The, the, the flip side of the coin that if we were to uh, do something positive for our species, that we could actually evolve this scenario into something very positive. So um, that was the number one moment uh, of my experience. Um, the second was working with Dan Barry, um, who I said is an astronaut from NASA. Um, in the we, we had a, a lab that had uh, tech that was sponsored by all types of companies. And um, in our in my free time, I teamed up with a with a with another student named Elena Hardy, and I told her I had a vision for flying my avatar in Second Life using a brain computer interface. So again, this goes back to the collaboration, the multidisciplinary approach, because she's a hardcore programmer. And here I am, like I'm an artist and I'm a visionary and I'm a producer and a project manager. So I'm telling her what my vision is. And she says, well, you know, I think we could make that happen. So we went into the lab, we start looking around and it's like, oh, well, here's like an emotive EEG headset. And she like went into Second Life and didn't really know how to code in Second Life language but you know she learned it fairly quickly and before I knew it this idea happened and it was so mind-blowing to be in a multiplayer game using brain computer interface and not using a keyboard or a mouse and especially flying like the simulation I was in was called Inspire Space Park and it really is like a bunch of planets and, and you can see the sun far away and you have all kinds of people doing well, avatars doing particle shows. And so I, I put my, my avatar in flight mode and I remember that I'm flying through space and I'm looking at the screen. And as I rotated my head back, my, I could like, I looked out of the corner of my eye and I could see my, like the avatar's view. Cause it, in first person, it does like a rotation for head rotation. And I could see that, that first person perspective turn around and look back. And I started crying and Elena was looking at me. She's like, you gotta be effing serious. You're crying. And I said, I can't believe this moment happened. Like, and it, it happened so quickly. It, it And she was like, well, you know, I mean, that was kind of cool. <laughs> And it was so cool that we actually ended up presenting at the National uh, uh, Second Life National Community Conference in San Francisco, and it made waves. And you know, we even had Philip Rossdale, who was the founder of Second Life, came out to NASA, and we, you know, we we show, showcased you know our, our work to him. Um, and he said, "I had no idea that was possible with with Second Life." 
And um, and I also showed him the the avatar uh, proof of concept that I did at AV Concepts with the holographic stage, the holographic avatars. And he was mind blown. You know, it's like he's he's like, I found it second life and I didn't know that was possible. And so that really was the beginning of like neuro gaming talk and a lot of like ideation that happened into using motion capture for avatars. Because the second proof of concept I did prior to going to NASA was um, using the organic motion markerless motion capture stage in New York to puppeteer an avatar that appeared on the Musion holographic stage in San Diego. And that had never been done before. So we actually, we, we were actually, we, we actually proved that you could do a performance in one city and, you know, be able to puppeteer something that appears as a, as a hologram in another city. So quantum superpositioning for performance was born and it was, it was possible. And that like level of mixed reality again had never been done. And so that, you know, just, it set us dreaming into what is possible. Like, oh, well, you know, could we do this in augmented reality glasses, you know? And this is before a HoloLens and, you know, even it, this is even before Google Glass. Um, and we, it, I, I talked to Ray about the virtual reality contact lenses that I had seen prototyped at the University of Washington with the back Parvis. And I said, you know, if what I did on Musion is possible in the future with increased computing power, that means that this type of effect will be possible on VR contacts or VR AR contacts. And sure enough, like I was at Singularity at NASA in 2011, that year Ray was hired to be head of engineering for Google, that year Google X was started, and that year Babak Parvis from the University of Washington was hired to join the Google X team. So it's it's mind blowing to look back and to think I was part of the creation of that and, and how far it's going to go. It is disruptive technology um, because that that's, that's everything we learned about was like, there's a difference between saying, Hey, I just, we, we, we created a new product and it's very cool. There's another thing to say, we are working in exponential technologies. And the third biggest thing that I remember from Singularity was really looking closely at that exponential curve. What does it mean? Because back then it was theory. I'm looking at a graph and I'm looking at a curve that goes like starts off slowly and then it shoots straight up. And then I'm seeing like the progressive, the progression of other technologies in the past, just kind of slightly going up. So I, I, I understood in theory what now seven years later, I understand is happening in the masses. I understand that disruptive technology is accelerating time, that people who say, well, that's never going to happen in my lifetime, or hey, you know, well, it'll be a long time before that happens. They're just thinking on regular linear time. When you jump into an exponential curve, that means time is speeding up. That means all of those inventions and all those things that we're talking about are going to be happening faster and faster and faster. All you have to do is look at motion capture. Back in 2010, when I did my proof of concept, I had to go to New York and beg the president of organic motion to please let me run this test because I was pretty sure that I could make it work with the Musion holographic stage back in San Diego. And then I had to go back to San Diego and convince the president of AV Concepts to let me do this. So um, that the system, the, the mocap system was $80,000. And just two weeks ago, I picked up an Nflux motion capture suit wireless that I can wear underneath my clothes for $300. And it runs on Unity, which means that the capabilities for glueware are there. You can integrate it with facial motion capture, with hand tracking. You can put it into a simulation. You can output it into any type of projection system that you want. So that's only a difference of six to seven years and a drop in price of $80,000 to $300. From, from something that required an entire room of sensors and to basically sensors that are wearable and you, you can use your phone to, you know, your iPad to program it. I mean, it, it blows my mind. If that is not a, an example of exponential technology, then what is? You know, I've seen a couple of people on Facebook. This guy's like, 
I can't believe that I spent $40,000 on a VR camera like a year and a half ago. And now you guys are buying like a Nikon 360, you know, for 400, 500 bucks and just grabbing the memory chip and put it into your phone and pop it into like a gear VR. And now you're in virtual reality. So something that cost within one year, $40,000 dropped to about a thousand dollars in a full like turnkey system. That's so amazing. And I'm just curious, like, do you think that it's the key individuals out there, like certain innovators and leaders that are really the ones paving the way for a lot of the innovation that we have out there? Or is it more a combined effort where everyone is contributing little bits and pieces that are taking us one step closer and eventually we hit that tipping point? So is it more of a group effort or more individual leaders that really pioneer and revolutionize and disrupt? I think it starts with one person, but it really is getting all the people together and pushing it to pioneer it. That is making the difference. So like, for example, when I graduated from CalArts with a master's in theater producing, might I add, <laughs> um, I went to work with Eon Reality, which had one of 20 existing cave systems in the world. A cave is a cave automatic virtual environment. It basically is a $1 million virtual reality simulator. And from there, um, I actually met other research scientists like at UCSD, Qualcomm Institute, who built the Star Cave, the Next Cave. And at that time, only like first the military and then aerospace, then Fortune 500s had access to this. I was actually helping to sell the systems to Fortune 500s. So do, as time progressed and I was involved with, you know, different events, doing speaking engagements, I met other people. And I remember I was in L.A. when the founders uh, and actually the creators of Oculus Rift were there and they were saying, oh, look at what we have. And I tested and I thought, eh, you know, I've seen like the big kind of helmet head mounted, you know, displays before. So I wasn't too impressed. And I was like, OK, this is going to have to be wireless. It's going to have to have greater presence. The great graphics are going to have to be better. There's got to be a way to st stabilize motion because the second this starts moving around, I want to throw up. Um, and I remember the first time that I went to two bit circus, which probably was about a year and a half ago. It's a company in LA. And they said, we know you, the type of experience you have, and we just want you to check out what we created. And I put on the HMD and I was a football player and it was photorealistic live action. And I'm looking at my body. It's first person perspective. And then I hear a coach and I'm like, okay, I'm a football player. I'm at a game. And the coach was like, okay, let's go. We start running out the tunnel. And as we're running out the tunnel into an entire arena of people and I, I'm hearing that, I'm feeling it. And then I think, oh my goodness, I am not motion sick this has just like hit the the holy grail of virtual reality with live action with controlled like you know uh, motion and um that's for the first time i felt that the head mounted displays could potentially reach the level of presence of a cave and at that point i knew that the 1 million dollar simulators that were only available to the few were now going to be available to the masses that, that this technology had the potential to hit critical mass and therefore disrupt every single industry, which is now what we're seeing happen. So it goes back to what you said. It's something that starts with a few people. And then once it's ready, it takes a lot of people to push it out from different disciplines. You push it out and that's what creates change. So now some of like, you know, um, the vibe, I mean, geez, like some of the things I'm seeing created, uh, I think actually are at the level of a cave system. And I don't need to go spend a million dollars and have a room for it or, you know, convince universities to build a lab for it. Now the power of a cave can fit in my backpack and that backpack can go with me anywhere in the world. And, you know, supposedly by 2020, um, the milestone of rolling out the, the contact lenses. So the power of a cave in a fingertip is what we're looking at. And uh, it's a game changer, of course. It's it's the total game changer. And I think at that point, it's like we've addressed the hardware, uh, the, the hardware question, but really the hardware has no power without a story. And so the content that we create 
is really what is the game changer because that content will be so addictive. It will be so immersive. People will be in this and living their lives completely on this all of the time that we really have to have ethics, address ethics and policy in the process of disruption. And I hadn't seen that uh, throughout my journey. It's like everybody's on a rush to to disrupt. And sometimes like, well, you know, are you being really careful about the content that you're creating? Maybe working with, a, you know, like the psychology sector to see if you can create modules that are actually beneficial for humanity and can create healing technologies versus just doing games that are, you know, meant for war or whatnot. But um, it's important to to bring that to life and, and to for people to realize that that whatever they create has a power to influence a lot of people. And and so with great response with great responsibility comes creation. Now I'm mean, I'm telling you it, it it is it is great responsibility, and that is what is being placed in the hands of millions of people. The great responsibility of the future of mankind by the content that they create. Right, right, and um, I guess for me, uh, one thing that I've always thought about, and I figure you can touch on, is uh, Second Life, and that's when I was living in Vancouver. I was working at a video game company Activision and we had one of the key people from Second Life come and speak with us and demonstrate a lot of what Second Life is because I had no idea. I'd never heard of it before at that point. And it was really interesting just kind of seeing this whole other interactive world. And even as crude in some ways as it is, it was pretty interesting just to kind of see that perspective and getting to know you and see the ways you interact. It was pretty obvious for me. I'm like, yeah, you're going to be a Second Life girl. You're going to definitely um, embrace something like that. Because again, it, it is just a hint towards where we're leading about having completely different lives inside of virtual reality, inside of other immersive environments. Um, what are your thoughts on Second Life, especially for those who aren't familiar with it? Mm -hmm. and, and also, you know, for gaming, like multiplayer gaming is the reasons why people love it. You know, um, I love it because it allowed me as an artist to be able to visualize a project before it ever broke ground in the real world. I went, I pitched the Shanghai World Expo with the simulation inside of Second Life. And, you know, I could draw something out. I could give it to my builders. They would build it. I would go in there. I would play with the environmental factors and, you know, lighting and whatnot. And then I would say, okay, let's try to run some physics simulations in, in here as well. And that is amazing that you can actually apply science within a simulation. And that's what got me thinking. The power of gaming to do simulation-based learning is the future of education. And then, you know, you're reading like Ready Player One and you're like, hey, that's, exactly what I, <laughs> that's exactly what I was encountered with when I first went into multiplayer gaming for the first time. I mean, I know that some other people um, love Second Life. And other, you know, other types of um, grids because, you know, uh, they have disability. And so that's their access to, you know, have some type of interaction with people. Um, other people love it just for the mere social aspect. Some other people are aspiring, you know, uh, artists. And, you know, if they're a musician and they figure like, well, I'm not going to make it in the real world. They go into the virtual world. And next thing you know, they got gigs and you're making you're getting paid virtual money. I mean, it, that's that's what really is a trip when you start getting paid virtual you're, when your avatar is <laughs> getting paid money and you're showing up and you're, I think of my avatars spoken at more conferences and is now being booked on more like virtual films and like machinima gigs than me in the real world. And, and I laugh. I'm like, Oh my God, that's funny. I, I have a video game that's interactive and makes me money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I think that's interesting too, is just, you know, we, we are in a, a world now where it actually can be profitable to play games or interact with other people. And yeah, there's so much, uh, within that, I, I feel like each year we're getting a step closer to that total immersion. And now it is a point where people are making money on YouTube. People are making money uh, in game selling uh, DLC, like downloadable content and um, being able to develop within those worlds. So finding people who spend their lives mining for weapons and, and other items in games and selling them on eBay, it's, just, it's definitely a different time. And I'm so intrigued to see where we kind of head in the coming decade or two, for sure. So what about AR and MR? So augmented reality, mixed reality, um, other areas like that. 
I think that's really fascinating with a lot of the technology coming out now where it's not just entertainment, but also obviously even today I saw um, a VR example of how doctors are able to train doctors in panic situations, having a patient on the table who's suffering and is in distress and testing them to see how they're going to react, what they're going to check for, going through the procedures, having a timer right next to them, so knowing that they've got to act fast. Um, there's technology like, God, I was just talking about this at dinner the other night, um, certain clothing outlets that you can go to, which will have a augmented reality mirror. So in other words, you can go and pick out your costumes, go up to the mirror and looking in the mirror, it will actually place those costumes on you so that we can swap them out or have recommended shirts that will go with those pants, things like that. So that way you can preview without ever getting changed um, how these clothes are going to look on you, what works, what doesn't. Same deal with going to certain eyewear places or optometrists, which will allow you to try on different glasses, frames to see which one is your, you know, uh, matches your style. So again, I, I think that's so interesting to see all the different ways that things are pairing off into these different areas. Exactly. And now you see the value proposition of the technology for people in architecture or salespeople. I mean, it is like a tool for visualization. And I think that people are more apt to buy something if they can visualize it and actually see it in their home or wherever it is that they want, or if they have the ability that if it's so user friendly that they can design it themselves and just make a call and say, hey, I want to buy this part and oh, here's a snapshot of what I want it to look. You know, uh, m most people would think that creating, being a creator, a content creator is impossible. But because of the advancements in technology and visualization tools, it's making it possible for people like, you know, even my, my friend Jackie, who used to be my boss. I mean, she's in her 60s and she's she just rocked out an entire like house design when she gave me a fly through and I just said wow like, you're doing things I, I I haven't even learned how to do but um you know it's it's, it's pretty incredible how uh how, if it's user friendly how adaptable it is to people of all ages and different backgrounds if they have access to a computer and it, and it's important to also like for people like you and me we've been around tech for a long time and we're like we're just fascinated by watching people from different industries and different backgrounds, you know, apply what we know or what we use, but apply it in different ways. And people always come up with new and innovative ideas and ways to use things. You know, like my cost, the costume designer um, over at the arena stage, he, he was asking the same question, like, well, you know, would I be able to do something like this if I use this kind of technology? And I said, yeah, actually, there are other people already doing it. But it's interesting when it's people that are not that it's like the tech. The tech people are have been experimenting with this, and now the rest of the industries are catching up and going like, "Was well, this possible?" So it creates a great conversation between you know different fields to come together and to work on projects. You know, um, a lot of a lot of what I'm doing right now at the Arena Stage Mead Center for American Theater is testing different you know technologies to see how some of it could be applied under mixed reality to a live performance stage. Because this is a perfect opportunity to see, like, how could we actually put some of these systems on a stage if you have live action or if you um, if you want to achieve a certain type of effect? Can you do virtual lighting? Can you do virtual sets? Can you, uh, for the production purposes, can you actually have uh, teams from around the world collaborating in a virtual space? Can you visualize a set before it ever gets built and not just as a model, but like see it way before from the beginning, from the drafts? There's just such a great conversation to be had creatively about what is possible and and how you can mix the reality. Because a lot of times, you know, people will say, well, that's great, Patty, and there's the VR and all of this stuff. But, you know, it's going to take away from from real life. You know, people are going to be so immersed in that that they're just not going to go out and take a walk, go hug a tree, have normal conversations. Well, what about you? I, did you always want to be in more of a creative space. I mean, obviously, you're someone that mixes um, a very technical world inside of a very creative space as well. And for you, I mean, I can't imagine like what the hell did you want to do um, early in life? Like, did you have a set career path? Obviously, you couldn't say at five years old, I want to do holograms. Um, is there a specific route that you wanted to take and you kind of segued into it? Or 
how did you get to where you're at now? The first thing I wanted to be was an astronaut. <laughs> so um, ironic that, you know, I ended up at Singularity University at NASA. So about the closest I've gotten so far. And uh, but after I, I decided that becoming an astronaut might require a lot of science and math, I thought, well, I want to be a theater producer. And that's because my grandmother was a theater producer. So I grew up on stage and um, and it was a big influence in my life, uh, so much so that when I was looking at um, graduate schools, I was torn between Cal Arts and Caltech. I was like, well, I really want to pursue computational astrophysics, but at the same time, I really want to be a theater producer and I have all of this event experience background. And so I went to Cal Arts. Um, I got a full scholarship, a full academic scholarship. And uh, ironically, on my third year of my master's, um, I took holography and it was a guest professor named William Auschler who changed my life. And uh, I wanted to take photography. I actually went to the art school and asked if I could take photography. And they said, well, we don't have beginning photography this you know, semester, but we have beginning holography. And I said, oh, sure, I'll take it. And I, yeah, I was like, oh, it's all the same. Sure, it must be artistic. And so I ended up in this class. And at the beginning, I couldn't understand anything because it was you know, very scientifically approached. And the second we got into the lab, I made the connection. It was like, oh, that's what you mean about the interference pattern. Oh, that's what you mean about the different types of uh, lasers that we're going to use. And I fell in love with it so much so that I secretly started offering to do other students' homework. And then eventually I, I was geeking out. I wanted as much time in the lab. I had like... Uh, my my skin and my fingers was peeling from all of the time I spent doing photochemistry. And this is real holography, not like Pepper's Ghost or virtual reality. I mean, a real holography, 3D, no glasses. And um, and then eventually my professor found out and he said, well, Patty, all you had to do was ask me if you could be my TA. So I said, OK, can I be your TA? And he gave me the keys to the lab and said, you know, go nuts. And so I did. And I ended up uh, my master's thesis, even though I was in the school of theater, um, ended up being called holodome, like holography dome. And I figured that, you know, to meet the requirements of the theater school, I would use the elements of design from theater production. So I used their uh, lighting designer. I uh, brought in a technical director from the theater school. I had original music composition made, uh, sound 3D sound design um, created inside of the holodome. Um, and then I brought in a production team from the theater school that helped me build it. And then on the outside, I had an idea of um, doing performance. So I teamed up with a student from I think he was with the School of Music and he was also a dan like a dancer musician. So he did this whole choreography piece around the holodome. And then we teamed up with the animation department and they said, well, we could actually do, you know, like seven different animation uh, films and project them around the entire perimeter of the gallery. And they represent the colors of, you know, of the spectrum of the holograms. And it got very artistic and experimental in a very CalArts way. But it, it was the biggest multidisciplinary collaboration in the history of CalArts. All of the deans funded me. And um, and I felt so proud. And, and then I ended up showcasing my work in a space that was meant for the School of Art, even though I was with the School of Theater. But then I had to go in there, defend my master's thesis as to what this had to do with theater. And I said, it's it's art being integrated into science, which now in my career is basically steam. You know, it's not STEM, it's steam. And the process of making holograms is a scientific process that uses photochemistry and, you know, um, it is science. And at the same time, I was incorporating all of the other different disciplines and just making it a full steam approach. And I told my mentor at the time, what I envision for my master's thesis doesn't exist yet. And she said, what do you mean? And I said, I envision holographic performers on a stage. I envision holograms of people on, on a stage with live actors, and I envision holographic sets moving around and um, the cost of really big Broadway productions coming down because I can change the scenic design on the fly with the push of a button. And she looked at me like I was crazy. And I said, one day it will be possible. It, you know, ironically, um, the first job that I got out of CalArts was at Eon Reality, 
and I had the option where I was going to get an interview. My, my mentor was trying to get me to, um, into an interview with the LA opera. She said, you know, we can get you to work at the LA opera. You can work in downtown with the red cat, which was the new, uh, theater that was built underneath the Walt Disney, uh, center, um, the Walt Disney uh, music hall. And at the same time that I was kind of going through that process, I met a scientist named Maurizio Saracini, who uses multispectral imaging for cultural heritage. He's actually the only real character in, um, in uh, what is it, the, the Da Vinci Code book. So Dan Brown met Maurizio Saracini, and Maurizio used to be a holographer, and he chose to um, choose the path of arts in science and so what he does with multispectral imaging helps with authentication documentation and preservation of great works of art and when he saw what the holograms that i was making he said i want you to go show your holograms to some people i know in irvine and so i show up at eon reality just out of cal arts with you know absolutely no experience in the tech world and I walk into their showroom and I see a cave system and I see a hollow stage and a hollow podium and all of this technology that I didn't know existed. My mind couldn't even fathom that that technology was real, you know, and I said, you mean to tell me the hollow deck is real? I mean, I was such a like a Star Trek geek growing up and I couldn't believe it was real. And so I was just fascinated like a kid at a candy store. And then the chairman comes out and he says, well, you know, uh, so-and-so tells me that you have a hologram and I want to see it. And so I said, okay, well, we have to step outside with the light of the sun because I don't have the lighting system with me. And so I'm showing him my hologram. He's like, wow, how did you do this? And I'm looking at uh, at him and going like, well, how did you just create that demo room? <laughs> and he said, well, you know, I really like this. I'm a big art enthusiast. So why don't you come and show your holograms here? And um, if you want, we can showcase them. And if some of our clients are interested in buying it or, you know, commissioning you to make some holograms, then that way we can start the relationship. And I ended up bringing so many people to the showroom that some of my people started buying their technologies. And he said, well, you know, I want to hire you. So that's how I got up, got into the technology industry and ended up working at a company um, full of engineers and programmers where I was the only person with a degree in theater producing. But I stepped into the cave and I realized that all that million dollar hardware was boring after 30 seconds. And I told the chairman, I said, you know, this requires a story. This really needs you know, an arts process, you need to come in here and you need to build stories that will keep people engaged because the value proposition for any client that's going to spend a million dollars is like, well, what can I do? How can I tell my story using the technology? And um, he started asking me about ideas that I had and going back to, you know, the thing I really wanted to do for my master's thesis. I said, well, we need to bring in some avatars and, you know, these these environments are static and they're just, you know, like even the trees don't move. It kind of makes me feel uncomfortable. So why don't we add some physics to the simulations? Let's add some avatars. I mean, ideally, if we could have multiple people inside of a cave simulation, I think that that would really, really help. And now it's social VR. So um, a lot of those conversations that started early on was because I was exposed to uh, scientists and people from different backgrounds and um in my spare time, you know, after work, since I moved to Irvine, I didn't really know anybody. I figured I'd go hang out with the techs. And so, you know, the techs, I'd take them out to have some beer and sushi. And then, you know, after hours or, you know, when there was free time, they take me behind the scenes and basically show me how they built these cave systems. And I consider that to be my full blown PhD education in, <laughs> in technology hardware. And um, and then future integration was basically how to put the content together with the hardware and how to evolve it into something that was smaller, portable, um, more affordable, how to get more people involved in the conversation. So um, it's been a beautiful experience. And I spent, you know, was it 2005? So we're talking over 10 years of my life that I spend in the tech sector. Um, and now I have the opportunity to take 10 years of experience in design and hardware systems and technology into what I absolutely love, which is theater. 
And, you know, I, I get to say I get to be in theater and, you know, as a trained theater producer and now designer um, that I can play in both worlds. It doesn't have to be one or the other. I could be in theater and I could also be a, a tech designer and an experienced designer. And it is such a blessing um, and it's pioneering. It's it's the first time the arena stage has taken a leap of faith to create such a position um, to to allow somebody that's not a playwright to come in and do research and development for technology applications and entertainment. Um, this is the first time they've done it. But if you look at their background, I mean, you know, first regional theater to win a Tony, you know, the first to tour the Soviet Union. Um, it is a, a foundation of American theater and they've been the first in many cases. And so it's not surprising that they are the first to be able to expand um, their program to involve somebody with my experience. And it, it, I think that this type of approach is something that is being adapted by other companies in the industry. I just read an article about Paramount Pictures creating, I think it was like a resident futurist, you know, position. And it is because uh, the arts and entertainment industries and organizations are starting to realize the fundamental importance of multidisciplinary approaches and working closely with the tech sector to create better solutions and not just for the sake of money, but for the sake of a positive human disruption. Right. And I guess there's so much new tech coming out all the time so rapidly. And I feel those who are willing to innovate and adapt early, this is a whole new playing field for them. And I think especially filmmakers and video games and entertainment, where the key thing to really we struggle with every day is to really immerse people and, and tell our story and for our audiences to really experience it rather than kind of feeling like they're watching a screen. You know, I feel like this is a chance for us to really be able to create that world, that experience that people are able to really immerse themselves in and forget that they're sitting in a theater watching, but instead they're a part of it and they can really feel it a lot more. Like, what are your thoughts on that? Right, exactly. And, and it's losing the fear, right? And it's it's about saying, well, instead of looking and doing certain, like all this research, trying to find somebody to tell us what can we do, it's stepping into the role of being the creator, and saying, well, if it if there's not that many people out there and I can't find any information, it's because you have to pioneer it. You have to create it. And that's what's happening. It's like, don't sit around, wait for somebody to put a solution in your hands. Go and create it. Rapid prototype it. You know, it's like expand your mind. And people need to start kind of reaching outside of themselves. It's not about being an expert in one field. It's about being an expert in many fields, being able to adapt life experiences and stories. But at the core of everything, they're looking for a story. They're looking to create something that will make people say, oh, I, I want to see more of this or I want to go watch this. And it comes down to the foundations that were laid out by Aristotle 2000 years ago with the six elements of drama. And um, that at the end is theater. We are trying to create theater. We are trying to recreate life. And if you look at, it, it's such an ancient art form, but the power that it has, right, with, to create and to influence people, Shakespeare used it to hold a mirror up to nature. Um, he used it with his history plays to enlighten the masses as to what was going on in, the, in that ta time. Um, we use it now in, in contemporary theater, and, and what we need is more people to create their own stories, to tell us what their narrative is. So it's not about how do you use the technology, it's about using the six elements of drama to create your own narrative and to become a content creator and to disrupt responsibly, do it with ethics, do it for, you know, to create positive change for the human species. That's so cool. And... Yeah, I, I love all this. I'm finding out a lot of really fascinating information here and getting to know more about you because, again, like our experience, we've always socially hung out and been great friends. But, um, yeah, I guess like you're one of the, the key people that I usually kind of switch off the work brain and just have a great time. And uh, so, in a way, this is really cool just to get to know this whole other side of you, which I'm loving. So cool. And Right now, like you're doing a lot of really fascinating new stuff. Like how did the project in DC end up happening? Like, do you want to talk a little bit about that? 
Well, um, the current position, I, again, going back to uh, pioneering, if it doesn't exist, you create it. My mentor, um, Doug Jacobs, told me I could put you in contact with the arena um, and just pitch him the dream, pitch him what you really want to do. And I think he probably was thinking it was going to be more small scale, like marketing. And I just went and pitched the deputy artistic director on well, there's a disruption coming and we need to get ready for it and we need to be at the forefront and we need to, you know, start looking at different types of technologies and how they can be adapted for live performance and stage and all aspects of production. Um, and I always thought, well, what's the worst that could happen if they say no, I'm right where I started. But if they say yes, I really hadn't thought about if they said yes and then yes happened. <laughs> so uh, I ended up getting... Um, the artistic residency for the arena stage and uh, heading research and development for technology integration into live performance. Um, so what I'm thinking where my mind is going with that is uh, to be able to partner up with uh, some of my my tech colleagues that I've known for the past 10 years. I mean, that's the beauty of having spent that much time in, in tech and um, everything from motion capture to multi-sensory systems um, to integration into costume design, integration into communications for uh, production processes and even administrative uh, processes, uh, portable VR systems that could travel the world and tell stories um, and also uh, do a knowledge transfer to other people in other regions of the world that might not have access to the tech, um, but put the tech in their hands and see what happens. Um, uh, even I've been thinking about transmedia uh, in regards to marketing. I mean, how can we have a transmedia approach using new emerging technologies um, that can integrate and weave stories from different platforms, different distribution platforms, and then lead people back to the theater? Um, all of that is a matter of, you know, the research and development aspect. Um, I've spent the last month and a half closing deals uh, with the, my top tech partners and, and people that I've known, friends that um, I've been in contact with for a long time. And, uh, you know, the, the beauty about the residency is that I spend two months at a time, two to three months in D.C. The other time I get to come back home and I spend most of my time traveling and, and meeting with tech partners. But it's um, the infinite possibilities. You know, even if when I start getting leads as to, hey, you got to go check out the Lytro camera or, hey, why don't we check out some drones that can broadcast into VR or holographic virtual reality in multiplayer gaming. I mean, I get leads all the time and I follow them. And um, and if if it seems like something that could be applied to a theater process, I'm more than welcome to more than happy to go and check them out and see if there's a potential partnership or, you know, the beauty about heading R&D is that I have a budget for this, so um, we could definitely play, and I can pay to play, um, which makes it more appealing for the people that I work with because that means we can rapid prototype fairly quickly. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. Um, I really want to dive into content creation, especially um, for special effects uh, in augmented reality, and um, I think that that is your realm. Uh, I think that the magicians of your realm um, have a very bright future in collaboration with the theater industry. And uh, yeah, that's definitely more to be seen, more to be t discussed. That's so awesome. And I don't know, I, I could talk forever about this stuff. This is really, really great. And I guess like I just want to say like thank you again for taking the time to to do this talk. I know it's been a long time coming, so I'm really excited about this and I'm sure everyone is going to get so much from it. So just quickly, like where can people go online to find out more about you? Um you can go to pattywrangle.com. That's p a t t y r a n g e l.com. Um and also uh you can look me up at the Arena Stage Mead Center for American Theater in Washington DC. That's so awesome. And thanks again for doing this. Uh, I had a blast and it's just good to catch up in general. So yeah, when you get up to Portland, we're definitely going to have to hang out or in San Diego or Mexico or wherever the hell, DC. Um, eventually, we're going to catch up somewhere. So uh, and yeah, again, I'd, I'd love to do another one of these sometime because I have so many questions I want to ask and I figure uh, time's always against us. So again, thanks for doing this. I really appreciate it.
Sure, sure. Anything, Alan. You know, I love you and I'm definitely going to see you in Portland and <laughs> anything. I mean, if, if there's people that, that have questions, of course, I'd be more than happy to jump on another call. All right. So I want to thank Patty for taking time to talk to me and discuss all of the amazing achievements that she's had. Uh, I'm really excited to see what she's going to work on next. And also just in general, um, the really interesting work that she's going to be performing and creating at the arena stage. So that being said, if you get a chance, share this episode around. I think that everyone can benefit from this. And at the same time, I've got some new awesome episodes coming up. I'm actually going to be interviewing Image Engine next week. So episode 91, discussing some of their work on everything. I mean, Image Engine is one of the leaders in doing creature work. Has worked with Neil Blomkamp since the beginning on all of his feature films, as well as working on shows like X-Files, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, uh, Game of Thrones, loads of stuff, Deadpool, lots of cool stuff. So um, that episode is coming up next. And in the meantime, if you get a chance, leave a comment and let me know what you think of this episode. And also let me know what your favorite episode is so far. I'd love to know. I know I have a few of my own personal favorites, but um, I'm always interested to see what are the ones that you find the most valuable. Uh, I've got lots of cool episodes, including a few that I'm going to be doing solo episodes because it's been a while. I've been doing a lot of interviews. So I've got a few of those coming up very soon as well. Lots of cool stuff in the mix. So I'll leave it there and I'll be back next episode with Image Engine. Rock on. <laughs>